Okay, so everybody's tired, and th I, this is the entertainment portion of the flight. Uh, no probabilities here. Uh, and I was, uh, it was suggested that I talk about entropy from a non-probabilistic point of view, which uh, Jakob uh, Ingvarsson and I have worked on in the past, and uh, this is slight work, yes, it does. Uh, so, now, here is something that many people know. I, I, many people have seen this, but just in case you haven't seen it, let me read it. This is about a conversation between Claude Shannon, everybody knows Shannon and von Neumann, regarding what name to give to the attenuation in phone line signals, which is what Claude Shannon worked on at Bell Labs. And uh, he says, I thought of calling it information, but the word was overly used, so I called, decided to call it uncertainty. Now we're back again to calling it information, by the way. Uh, history goes in big arcs, comes around again. Uh, Van Neumann told me you should call it entropy for two reasons. In the first place, your uncertainty function has been used already in statistical mechanics under that name. So it already has a name. In the second place, and more important, nobody knows what entropy really is. So in a debate, you will always have the advantage. Now, I put this here not to get a laugh. I got a few laughs I could hear. I wish they were louder, but anyway. <clears throat> I put it here because one always has to be careful in science of using correct names in a unique way uh, and not mixing things up by using one word for several different meanings. And there are lots of entropies floating around. Lots. Uh, not only is there Shannon's uh, entropy, as we already know, P log P, but there's the Rennie entropy, and, and then there's quantum entropy, and there's, uh, yeah, it's all the stuff, all kinds of things, and they're not identical. And, and uh, the, unfortunately, we tell our students who study statistical mechanics in elementary courses that entropy has something to do with chaos and uh, things like that. Well, uh, for me today, to this talk, entropy is entropy in the good old 19th century sense, and that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about P log P, so that's, uh, all right. So it's good to know what entropy is before we try to explain it. Okay, so in information theory and probability theory, Shannon entropy, what does it do? It tells us how much we win if we decipher a message correctly. Puts a price on decoding a message or what it takes to overcome noise. Uh, there are many ways you can describe this or distinguish probability distributions and all kinds of things like that. In statistical mechanics and probability theory, it measures the randomness of a gas or the defects in a solid. For example, and more precisely, it measures how much phase space is actually being used by an equilibrium system. Okay, that's statistical mechanics. And in this way, in this sense, it has some, been, in many cases, very successful. In other cases, not so. Uh, in thermodynamics, however, it measures what can or cannot be done to a body without changing the rest of the universe. That's what it measures. That is, it measures potentiality. Clausius invented the word entropy as a suitable name for what he had been calling the transformational content of a body. The new word made it possible to state the second law in the brief but alarming form, the entropy of the universe tends towards a maximum. This unfortunately uh, there's problems with this, which I will mention maybe later. Uh, but the, the entropy of the universe is something that uh, appeared to be quite natural in the 19th century, or the, the mechanics of the universe, 
let's put it that way, the Newtonian mechanics of the universe. But unfortunately, the mechanics of the universe works very differently from the atoms in a gas. Anyway, here's the, what Clausy has cooked up, for those who haven't seen it before. Uh, the Greek roots of entropy, uh, I hope I have this right, uh, N, which means it comes in, and trope, which is a turning or a transformation or something like that. So that's uh, what entropy does according to Clausius. It, it tells us about transformation. It doesn't tell us about chaos. Now, so we call that uh, Clausius, uh, to Clausius, entropy is related to possible changes. And what, uh, from that point of view, I would like to say uh, how, one, at least our way of, of looking at entropy, thermodynamic entropy, that steam engine that you saw before. So we, entropy has something to do with uh, containers of uh, water and solids and things and various things on the laboratory table. And uh, uh, it also has something to do with the weight. So we imagine that we've got all these uh, various objects that we want to describe, the transformations of these objects. We imagine that uh, uh, we can do the experiments on the table. But one thing we must have in order to do anything interesting is have a weight. Now, what does the weight do? The weight tells us how much energy is being used in the process. And if you think about it, energy is a very strange concept. It's, uh, there are two conserved quantities according to Hamiltonian mechanics. One is momentum and another is uh, energy, but what is energy? I mean, if I tell you that the energy in this bottle of water is so and so, uh, what does it mean to you? How do you measure it? How do you confirm uh, what I'm saying? Well, basically, in order to measure entropy, you have to have a standard meter, or like a meter stick, some standard piece of energy to which you're going to compare anything else. Uh, if I tell you the en energy of a photon is so and so, what does that mean? Well, the something else you have to is going to be, let's say, moving a weight in a gravitational field. That will be our standard measure of energy. Everything will be related to how much we can move a weight up. Or if you don't like that, you can have a spring uh, or a lossless cavity full of radiation or whatever you want. So there's going to be one standard of energy. And anyway, the important point is that Newtonian mechanics has to be brought into the game. If you're going to talk about energy, you have to have a standard. And that comes with Newtonian mechanics, whether you like it or not. All right, so now all this apparatus that I've got, on, I've got uh, the, my stuff on the table, I've got a weight, and uh, I've got computers, I've got whatever. Uh, all this apparatus can be utilized to try to change an equilibrium state of some system into an equal or into an equilibrium state. So, so I know this isn't correct English. It's plural. I really meant plural of the same or different system. Right? For example, I could have mixtures. I can pour one bottle into the other, and I can do all kinds of things like that. Uh, so that's my laboratory. That's my setup, and. Uh, and that's my weight. So here's the, here's the fundamental experiment of classical thermodynamics. This uh, <coughs> beautiful painting was made by Steinun uh, Jakobsdotter. You can figure what Jakobsdotter comes from. So adiabatic accessibility. Um, <coughs> This is the, the basic, the fundamental thing. You take your stuff. Well, let me read this first. At the end of, uh, you, you, you uh, take your stuff. Yeah, let me put it that way. You take your stuff and you put it in a room. And in this room, there's a gorilla. The gorilla is a, a 
symbol for just chaotic nature if necessary, but also this is a very clever gorilla. And the, and the gorilla can do infinitely clever things. It can tear the system apart. It can uh, decide what it's going to do as the system evolves. So you have a system evolving in time, according to somebody's mechanics. But then there's this gorilla who can stick his finger into it any time he wants to do it. At the end of the day, however, at the end of the day, you look at what's uh, going on, and you find that the system might have changed, but nothing else in the universe has changed, including all the machinery that the gorilla has used. Uh, and ex uh, yeah, that's why I said. Now, I emphasize, I want to emphasize very strongly that entropy here, uh, which we're going to get to in a minute, it, it, or rather, let me stay with the word adiabatic accessibility. This process does not have to be slow, nothing about quasi-stationary stuff or anything like that. Forget that. They always tell you in the textbooks that you have to do it, go along the curb real slow like that. You don't have to do it. This can be violent, whatever. You don't know what's going on in this room. But at the end of the day, you find the system changed from x to y. And a weight might have moved. That's the fundamental process. And if you can go from one system, one system in a state x to a system in a state y, uh, this or some other, for example, you could have changed the system, uh, <clears throat> then we say, we write that as saying, that x precedes y. So we imagine all possible states of all possible systems. Equilibrium states, I should add. So entropy for us really has something to do with equilibrium states. It is not so easy. In fact, I, we don't really know how to do it, to define entropy out of equilibrium. You can, in statistical mechanics, you can do that. But in real life, it's not so easy to do this in an unambiguous way. We can define upper entropies and lower entropies to systems out of equilibrium. It's not terribly useful. But there's no unique way that we are able to think about to, dis to define entropy when a system is not equilibrium. So we're talking about equilibrium states. And we say x precedes y if you can get from x to y. <coughs> OK. So then, next thing we do. So then we imagine a huge list. Here's the huge list. Containing all possible pairs of processes. So you imagine all possible systems, for example, this and a whatever, a piece of lead, or all possible systems in all possible equilibrium states. That's the universe that we're talking about. And uh, <clears throat> we write down all the x's preceding y's. Now, if we lived in a universe in which uh, <clears throat> you could go from x to y and always from y to x, and it would be a very uninteresting universe, what makes the universe interesting is that you can go from x to y, but you cannot always go from y. In fact, you usually not go from y back to x. Sometimes you can. That's uh, called adiabatic. It's not the adiabatic we're talking about. But, uh, <clears throat> In general, they have this huge list of x's to y. And what we want to do, and here's the key point of this talk, is find some quantity, some like, like temperature or something, except it isn't temperature, that will uh, parameterize or characterize or whatever uh, all these processes, all these possible processes by one number one number, which you attach to the state of the system, or all systems in the universe. So every system in the universe has this number attached to it. It's stamped on it, S. And the, uh, so the entropy principle, this is, a, this is what we would like to achieve. The entropy principle is that for every equilibrium state x of every system, there is a number s of x, called entropy, which has the following properties, key properties. x precedes y if and only if s of x is less than or equal to s of y. 
Uh, and this function, this is called monotonicity, and this function is unique. That's what we would like to achieve, up to a multiplication by a universal constant, of course. Um, so we would like our entropy to do that. If you, Second thing we would like to do is the following. If I take two systems and regard them as one system, but maybe, say, connect them a little bit and take them apart, whatever. If I take two systems, one in state x and the other in state y, I can think of this as a system. Why not? It's an equilibrium. Uh, I would like the entropy of this combined system to be the sum of the entropies. That's additivity. Thus, the increase of entropy, that is the second law, that's the first thing, is built into the definition of entropy. The increase is built into its definition. There is no mention of temperature or heat, uh, not at all, in this, not at all. No temperature, no heat, no energy except that weights might have moved up and down. Now, one of the things that entropy was supposed to do is be additive. So <clears throat> here it is. Now, this is something that most people who talk about entropy, uh, I mean, they, they, they don't mention too much because it's considered to be not so very important, but it's key, this additivity. Now, if you think about it, it's a miracle. Because here I have a bottle of water and a bottle of alcohol. And they don't know each other. It's completely independent systems. And there's a cup of coffee. And they, these are just different systems. They, they don't talk to each other in any way. But the textbooks will tell you that the entropy is additive. Now remember, what the entropy is, is the things that tells you what kinds of transformations are possible. That goes back to Clausius. So what I can do with a with water, bottle of water and a bottle of alcohol is determined by its entropy. Remember, it can go from here to anything else. For example, I could pour the alcohol into the water or vice versa and create a new kind of system. All of these things are determined by the entropy increasing. But what is the entropy? Well, I have to know what it is. And the rule is that the entropy of these two things is the sum of the entropy, even though they don't talk to each other. Now, that, that, and that fact. Uh, is a miracle, no reason why it should be that way. And um, now in statistical mechanics, where you make a probabilistic model of the world, this comes for free. Why? Because the partition function for uh, two systems is just, or the, the Boltzmann factors are just the product of the Boltzmann factor. That's true even in quantum mechanics. It's just the product. So the trace of a product is the product of the traces of the integrals. So in statistical mechanics, it's for free. But in the real world, it's not for free. So this is a fundamental property, the additivity, and you will not find this mentioned very much in textbooks. So. It says that while the entropy of individual systems appear to have indeterminate, unrelated, multiplicative constants, all the systems in creation can be adjusted to each other so that additivity holds. Now remember, entropy of a system is determined up to a multiplicative constant. Right? We, we, we learned that in the quantum 101 or something. But I can adjust the constants of all the systems in the world this arbitrary multiplicative constant for each system in such a way that it's additive. So you think about that. This is very surprising. Uh, and the system, general systems have nothing to do with each other. So this uh, additivity uh, 
together with monotonicity, that is, entropy increases if and only if you can go from A to B or X to Y, tells us exactly how much entropy increase is required of one system in order that a second system can decrease its entropy, even though the, those two systems are totally dissimilar and don't talk to each other. So let me repeat that. Um, the whole of, me of mechanics, the, the turbine that we had before, is, ba is based on the fact that while entropy has to go up for an individual system by the gorilla, by anything you do to it, the entropy will go up. But, another, but I would like it to go down. And I can get it to go down by taking a partner, and the partner has entropy that goes way up, so this guy can go down. And that's why this, the turbine works. And so this is a very important thing. And it's just, uh, I repeat, it's a, at least for me, it's a kind of model, um, a miracle. Now, for model builders, people who like to build dynamical models, uh, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. To, to, and now, of course, if you just write down a, a Boltzmannian formalism with uh, you know, independent uh, probability distributions, well, then it comes out for free, as I said. But if you try to make a real model where mach machines interact with each other, this is not so easy to get. In statistical mechanics, it's easy. But for example, uh, we know that interaction with the radiation field is very important for the atoms in this bottle of water. I don't care what you say. And likewise for these. So how, how come the radiation field is screened so well that they behave independently and the entropy is additive? I mean, this is real physics, and it's, uh, we claim. OK, so here's some axioms that are going to let us do this. Now, there are more <coughs> axioms, and I'm only giving you the first six. Uh, but just, just so you get the idea. So we're, go we're going to construct entropy with our bare hands. And here is the axioms we're going to need about equilibrium systems, that you can go from x to x. OK, that's, that looks easy. Uh, if you can go from x to y and y to z, then you can go from x to z. Transitivity, that's easy. You believe that. Uh, if you can go from x to x prime and y to y prime, two different systems, then you can go from the pair x, y to the pair x prime, y prime. That's easy. But that's not additivity. That's only partial additivity. That is to say, what is interesting is that you can go from x, y to x prime, y prime, with x prime going entropy going down and y prime going up and up. That's what's interesting. But here the assumption is only if they both can do it. Scaling invariance. Now, scaling is very important. Uh, and that's why it breaks down in the, for gravitating systems. Uh, if, if you take lambda moles of x and lambda moles of y, uh, you can go from one to the other if you can go from x to y. So it's a scale invariant. And this is why the entropy of the universe in this sense, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because gravity is not additive. It's very much not additive. Very much. Um, the, the gravitational energy uh, of a body depends on its mass density and uh, goes as whatever, the, the one over the radius times the total mass, OK, <coughs> squared. Um, so gravity fails. So I always get nervous when people talk about entropy of black holes and things like that. I mean, I'm all for it. But, it, but please understand, it doesn't satisfy the usual rules that we are accustomed to in ordinary earthy thermodynamics. OK. And uh, here's another rule. I can go from x to two containers. I can split it into two containers, one with one minus lambda moles and the other with lambda moles. Put, take this bottle of water and put it into two glasses. 
and stability. And I need some kind of continuity. There are no, there are no pictures of x and y, u and v, nothing like that here at this stage. Uh, so if I can go from x and a tiny bit of something else, a grain of dust, to y and a grain of dust, there may be a different grain of dust, then if I can do this for arbitrarily small epsilon, and some grains of dust, then I can do it without the grain of dust. In other words, if I, I, lots of processes go with a catalyst. But in principle, I can go without, if I can go with a catalyst and remove the catalyst, then I can go without it. It might take a long time, but OK. Now, the comparison property. The following property turns out to be essential for deriving an entropy function. It appears to be an additional axiom, but it can actually be de deduced when coordinates are introduced. What coordinates? Well, u and v and all the usual stuff we see in the textbooks. And we list it separately. The symbol, uh, here I'm going to use a symbol. Gamma denotes the space of equilibrium states of some given system of a given size. Lambda gamma is its scale copies. And gamma times gamma prime are two, space dates, two state spaces of pairs of states in gamma and gamma prime. So they're two systems. And the com comparison property is that if the two states x and y mean that uh, means that either x, and this is what the assumption is, that either you can go from x to y, or you can go from y to x, or both. So you do not have isolated states that you cannot get to or get from. That's an assumption. That's an assumption. But a little bit more, you can, I won't go into this. But basically, that's the assumption. You're not locked in an island where you can't move because, well, all right, we require this property of all state spaces, all systems of the universe. And it is this property, together with the zeroth law, that uh, calibrates everything together to yield a consistent entropy function, one such that the entropy of two systems together is the sum of the entropies. It's this fact, this comparison fact. OK. so. We're now, uniqueness of the entropy function. Uh, the existence and uniqueness of the entropy function on a state space up to multiplicative and additive scale transformation. We, the additive uh, transformation will use Nernst's third law uh, to set this, the additive part. But it's, uh, is equivalent to axioms A1 to A6, which I gave you before about adiabatic accessibility plus the comparison property. This is the basic theorem. So that's enough to guarantee that the whole system works. Uh, now, the uniqueness is very important, uniqueness of entropy up to, up to multiplicative constant. Why? Because there are many different ways to measure entropy in the laboratory. And we want them all to agree. If they don't agree, we're We've got a real problem on our hands. OK, so uh, okay. So the entropy characterizes adiabatic accessibility and is additive and extensive. Uh, and these this properties are fulfilled. OK. Now, uh, let's see. I think I've just about used up my time. So uh, well, I'll tell you how to construct entropy. This is how you construct entropy. We haven't mentioned temperature, and we haven't mentioned heat. I'm going to construct entropy for you. OK. So I'm going to define the entropy of a point. Uh, so I imagine a state space of all possible states of, say, this bottle of water. And uh, I do it in the following way. I take the state space for water, or this bottle, this particular bottle of water, the state space. It, Usually, it's characterized by energy and volume, but uh, whatever. Anyway, I take this state space, and I take two points. That is, two states of this water bottle, whatever they may be, different ones, so that I can go from one to the other, from x0 to x1. And remember, comparison says I must be able to do one way or the other. And I cannot go backwards, so I can only go in one direction. So here are these two points. I pick at random two points. I call the entropy of this guy 1 and this guy 2, give it a name. Uh, 
And now the entropy of any other point is defined in the following way. You take the entropy of x0, which is 1, and you add to it the soup over lambdas of the following thing. I break, I take a, a convex combination, a certain number, number of moles of x0 and a certain number of moles of x1, and I go from that into x. And the largest lambda so that I can do this is what I add to the to 1, and that will give me the entropy of x. I realize this is uh, a, a little bit funny. You don't understand it. I'll show you a picture, then it'll become clear. Here's the usual state space, u and v, as people usually like to draw it. Here are the uh, curves of points that, so that you can go forwards and backwards. That's not a, anyway, here's x0. I pick a point. Here's another point, x1. There it is. Pick two points. And here's x. I want to define the entropy of x without any heat or temperature or anything like that. Here's how I, no dq over t, none of that stuff. So here's how we do it. And suppose x is in the middle. It could also be out here or it could be down here, but let's discuss this case. Uh, now, I can go from x0 to x. That's easy. But I cannot go from x1 back to x. I'm supposing that's true. It's sort of caught in the middle. I cannot go from x1 to x. I can go from x0 all the way to x1 if I want to. Remember, by comparison, I can go one way or the other. So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to pull back lambda moles of x1. I'm going to try to pull it in the wrong direction by using this many moles of x0. In other words, I take two containers, one of which has x0 in it, the other has x1 in it, of this glass of water, and I'm going to co combine them to give, the, to give the one mole of x that I would like, and I take the maximum amount of this guy that I can pull back in the wrong direction, or the minimum amount of this guy that I have to use. So think of this as cold water, this is hot water. The minimum amount of cold water I can use, or the maximum amount of hot water that I can use to produce x. That defines the entropy of x, without any heat or, te or temperature or anything like that. So that's how you construct an entropy function out of thin air. Okay. Uh, so entropy is determined by the enormous table of adiabatic processes if the table satisfies certain non-controversial axioms and since I'm running out of time. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm, I've got one minute. Uh, it is essential, of course, that this table of x to y's is reproducible. The universe is constructed so that this table is reversible. If we didn't have this reverse, uh, but not reversible, sorry, reproducible, sorry, I'm using the wrong word, that we have a fixed reproducible table of transformations. If we don't have that, the game's off. But we do, fortunately. Um, now, once again, adiabatic does not mean slow or reversible or anything similar. It means here that an experiment carried out by an arbitrarily crafty experimenter, the gorilla, leaves the rest of the universe unchanged except for the possible movement of a weight. And a weight can be moved. The existence of one label S that suffices to tell what can happen and what cannot is enormously useful and predictive in the world. This kind of theory is sometimes called a resource theory uh, in modern parlance. Okay. Um, now, uh, I, since I'm out of time, I just, if, what this says is, I'll be very quick now, what this says is, uh, if we now introduce coordinates, uh, volume, or whatever, the various work coordinates and the energy, now, oh, by the way, why does energy come in? Why does energy play a special role? It's because uh, we've got this weight, which gives us a unit of energy. And if I go from some state x to another state y, however I do it with, with this gorilla, fast, slow, doesn't matter. The amount by which the weight went up or down 
is fixed. That's an experimental fact. That's the first law of thermodynamics, that the, that the energy is a good coordinate to describe the state of a system. That's the first law of thermodynamics, that the, how, how much the weight went up or down to go. Arbitrarily slow or fast or doesn't matter. OK. Um, that's the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, there's a zeroth law which says uh, that I can bring two systems in equilibrium by passing a copper thread between them and exchange energy. Uh, but I, I will not go into that more because I'm... OK, so there are a couple of take-home messages. From thermodynamic point of view, entropy, unlike probabilistic notions, uh, is, is not like a thief that robs us when we are not paying attention. Rather, it can be viewed as a guide that constrains what cannot, can and cannot be done to change from one equilibrium state to another. That's what entropy is from the thermodynamic point of view. It's not an enemy. Uh, however one defines entropy, to be really useful, it is important to show and appreciate the fact that it is unique and additive over unrelated systems. Thanks for listening.